you want to believe? Man has not been content pondering the mysteries of life on Earth. At night, we have looked up at the stars and wondered about the possibility of alien life. Are there other intelligent beings looking up into the night sky, asking the same question, somewhere else in this vast universe? Civilizations that have achieved interstellar communication and have established a network of linked societies throughout our galaxy? Governments have denied the existence of UFOs, yet the number of leaked reports from various agencies indicate that there is a hidden truth. A deeper truth. There are many that believe that the truth is out there, and that there are forces who don't want humanity to know, who much rather would have us live in ignorance to hold us down, chained to the belief that we are alone in the universe. Noted psychoanalyst William Reich delved into the field of aliens in his last book, Contact with Space. He died in prison, the victim of governmental persecution and book burnings. A coincidence? In 2017, scientists at a Hawaiian observatory saw an object soaring through the inner solar system, moving so quickly that it could only have come from another star. Avi Loeb, Harvard's top astronomer, explained that it could not be an asteroid. It was moving too fast along a strange orbit and left no trail of gas or debris in its wake. The only conceivable explanation was that the object was a piece of advanced technology created by a distant alien civilization. Our first alien mystery of outer space was at first designated as A-2017U1 and later named Aumuamua, which in Hawaiian means scout or visitor from afar arriving first. Researchers were stymied when they discovered the enigmatic cigar-shaped object screaming away from the solar system at nearly 57,000 miles per hour. Moving too fast to have originated from our own system, it was traveling on a U-shaped hyperbolic orbit that took it around the sun and sent it back out into interstellar space. Astronomers using the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System Telescope in Hawaii uncovered the odd object. Researchers trained as many telescopes on Aumuamua as possible to learn more about the object before it became too dim for instruments to see. They found it to be between 1,300 feet and 2,600 feet long and thin, perhaps six times smaller in width than in length. The visitor was tumbling end over end and had a dark red color. Scientists determined that it had come from the direction of the constellation Lyra, though no one has figured out precisely what system it originated in. The current consensus in the scientific community is that Aumuamua is a comet 
because it's moving faster than expected if it were just being propelled by gravitational tugging from the sun. This jet-driven motion makes Aumuamua sound like a spacecraft that came from another star, took a quick pass through our system, and then sped away. Avi Loeb begs to differ. Along with his co-author, Shmal Biali, he released his own conjecture that Aumuamua was a gossamer-thin light sail from an advanced technological civilization. In an effort to help explain the object's comet-like non-gravitational acceleration, his reasoning centered on the fact that outgassing would have altered the visitor's rotation period, an effect that should have been easy to identify but wasn't seen. A subsequent report on observations by the Spitzer Space Telescope set a tight limit on cometary outgassing of any carbon-based molecules and indicated that Aumuamua is at least 10 times more shiny than a typical comet. Why haven't we returned to the moon since Eugene Cernan left its surface in 1972? Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin claimed they had witnessed UFOs on the moon's surface, quote, lined up on the far side, watching us. Neither Armstrong nor Aldrin have commented much outright on the matter. However, a professor, speaking under anonymity, talked with Armstrong at a NASA symposium years after the moon landing. Armstrong was asked what really happened, and his reply was that they were, quote, warned off. Furthermore, that any plans for a space station near the moon or a moon city were gone immediately. When asked why further NASA missions went ahead following the initial landing, Armstrong would reason that such a sudden ending might have caused panic on Earth. However, the subsequent missions were simply, quote, quick scoop and back again, end quote, operations. According to Alexander Kassensev, Buzz Aldrin had begun filming the strange objects from inside the landing module, while Armstrong was taking his historic first step on the lunar surface. Further still, he would continue filming, discreetly, when he himself went outside. The film was promptly removed by intelligence services, Armstrong would confirm this version of events, but would not comment any further when asked. Might it be that the conspiracies surrounding the moon landings are legitimate? Only the conspiracy is not whether we landed on the moon or not, but why we didn't return. And what exactly did we really find when we landed there? I just see it uh, as a beginning. Uh, not just this flight, but in this program. In 1979, Maurice Chatelain, who worked for a subcontractor of NASA, confirmed that Armstrong had indeed reported seeing two UFOs on the rim of a crater. Chatelain believes that some UFOs may come from our own solar system, specifically Titan.
quote, the encounter was common knowledge in NASA, but nobody has talked about it until now. All Apollo and Gemini flights were followed, both at a distance and sometimes also quite closely by space vehicles of extraterrestrial origin, flying saucers, or UFOs, if you want to call them by that name. Every time it occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered absolute silence. I think that Walter Schura aboard Mercury 8 was the first of the astronauts to use the code name Santa Claus to indicate the presence of flying saucers next to space capsules. However, his announcements were barely noticed by the general public. It was a little different when James Lovell on board the Apollo 8 command module came out from behind the moon and said for everybody to hear, Please be informed that there is a Santa Claus. Even though this happened on Christmas Day, 1968, many people sensed a hidden meaning in those words, end quote. The rumors persist. NASA is a civilian agency, but many of its programs are funded by the defense budget, and most of the astronauts are subject to military security regulations. The National Security Agency screens all films and probably radio communications as well. We have the statements by Otto Binder, Dr. Gary Henderson, and Maurice Chatelain that the astronauts were under strict orders not to discuss their sightings. And Gordon Cooper has testified to a United Nations committee that one of the astronauts actually witnessed a UFO on the ground. If there is no secrecy, why has this sighting not been made public? This is a conversation between Apollo 11 and Mission Control. Those are giant things. No, no, no. This is not an optical illusion. No one is going to believe this. What? 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 What the hell is happening? What's wrong with you? They're here, under the surface. What's there? The mission interrupted. Interference. Control calling Apollo 11. We saw some visitors. They were here for a while observing the instruments. Repeat your last information. I said that there were other spaceships. They're lined up on the other side of the crater. Repeat, repeat. Let us sound this orbit up. And 625 to 5. Automatic relay connected. My hands are shaking so badly I can't do anything. Film it. God, if these damn cameras have picked up anything, what then? Have you picked up anything? I didn't have any film at hand. Three shots of the saucers, or whatever they were, they were ruining the film. Control, control here. Are you on your way? What's the uproar with the UFOs, over? They've landed here. There they are, and they're watching us. The mirrors, the mirrors. Have you set them up? Yes, they're in the right place. But whoever made those spaceships surely can come tomorrow and remove them. Over and out. Although there is cooperation between American and Soviet astronauts and cosmonauts now, during the Cold War, there was little cooperation between American astronauts 
and Soviet cosmonauts. The cosmonauts had multiple encounters during this period. One of the most bizarre occurred during the downfall and breakup of the Soviet Union. 28th of September, 1990. In a radio interview with Gennady Mankakov and Gennady Strekalov, Mankakov made some startlingly blunt statements in response to the most interesting phenomena he has witnessed. He claimed that, quote, only yesterday he had witnessed an unidentified flying object, end quote, from the Mir space station. Mankakov said that this great silvery sphere was near the North Pole area of the Earth and approximately 20 to 30 kilometers above the Earth. It was, quote, much larger than a huge ship. When the interviewer suggested that the object might have been an iceberg, Mankakov dismissed this notion, stating that the object was enormous and that it could have been an experimental sphere or something of that nature. He would further state, I was observing it for around six or seven seconds and then it disappeared. It was just hovering over the Earth. The Soviets were notorious for suppressing extraterrestrial encounters. One of the most interesting appeared in the 28th February edition of the Rabochaya Tribuna, a Moscow newspaper, and took place overnight between the 14th and 15th of June 1980 on the Salyut 6 spacecraft. The chief engineer of the Cosmonaut Training Center, Vladimir Alexandrov, burst into the main office of the Rabochaya Tribuna, a Moscow newspaper with a picture of what he claimed was a UFO, taken by cosmonauts Valery Ryumin and Leonid Popov. Furthermore, he would claim, as many researchers had said for some time, that Soviet authorities went out of their way to ensure that the incident remained concealed from their own populace, as well as the world. Number 5. UFO Caught by the Scanner of Major Gordon Cooper Gordon Cooper, the last American astronaut to fly in a solo mission in space, has a highly trustworthy UFO sighting story. The sighting happened on the final orbit around the planet during one of his solo missions in a Mercury capsule. He witnessed a green glowing object traveling at high speed towards his capsule. This UFO was caught by Cooper's scanner. It was directly reported to the space station on Earth, but the journalists that later interviewed Gordon were forbidden to ask about the sighting. Major Gordon Cooper is one of the few astronauts to ever speak about the truth behind UFO sightings. He revealed several major secrets during a taped interview years later, claiming that he was forced to keep all his sightings a secret.
He also said that American radars capture UFOs on a daily basis, but all remain hidden from the public as the government does not want to cause panic. This is what he shared in an interview in 1997. I know other astronauts share my feelings, declared Cooper, 69, who went into space aboard a Mercury craft in 1963 and on a Gemini craft two years later. And we know the government is sitting on hard evidence of UFOs. Cooper first encountered UFOs as a military pilot in Germany in the early 1950s when unidentified craft were spotted over an airbase. We thought they could have been Russian. We regularly had MiG-15s overfly on our base. We scrambled our Sabre jets to intercept and we got our ceiling of 45,000 feet. They were still way above us, traveling faster than we were. These vehicles were in formation like a fighter group. They were metallic silver and saucer shaped. Believe me, they weren't like any MiGs I'd seen before. They had to be UFOs. In 1957, Cooper was one of an elite band of test pilots at Edwards Air Force Base in California in charge of advanced projects, including the installation of a precision landing system. I had a camera crew filming the installation when they spotted a saucer. They filmed it as it flew overhead and hovered, extended three legs as landing gear, and slowly came down to land on a dry lake bed. These guys were all pro cameramen, so the picture quality was very good. The camera crew managed to get within 20 or 30 yards of it, filming all the time. It was a classic saucer, shiny, silver, and smooth, about 30 feet across. It was pretty clear it was an alien craft. As they approached closer, it took off. When his camera crew handed over the film, Cooper followed standard procedure and contacted Washington to report the UFO. All heck broke loose. After a while, a high-ranking officer said when the film was developed, I was to put it in a pouch and send it to Washington. He didn't say anything about me not looking at the film. That's what I did when it came back from the lab, and it was all there just like the camera crew reported. When the Air Force later started Operation Blue Book to collate UFO evidence and reports, Cooper says he mentioned the film evidence. But the film was never found, supposedly. Blue Book was strictly a cover-up anyway. Cooper revealed he's convinced an alien craft crashed at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, and aliens were discovered in the wreckage. I had a good friend at Roswell, a fellow officer. He had to be careful about what he said. It sure wasn't a weather balloon like the Air Force cover story. He made it clear to me what crash was a craft of alien origin, and members of the crew were recovered. Why has the government kept its UFO secrets for so many years? It started in World War II, when the government didn't want people to know about UFO reports in case they panicked. They would have been fearful it was superior enemy technology that we had no defense against it. Then it got worse in the Cold War for the same reason. So they told one untruth, they had to tell another to cover that one, then another, then another. It just snowballed. And right now, I'm convinced a lot of very embarrassed government officials are sitting there in Washington trying to figure out a way to bring the truth out. They know it's got to come out one day, and I'm sure it will.
Joseph A. Walker was sent on direct missions to detect and photograph UFOs. At least, this is what Walker claimed himself. He was an American World War II pilot, experimental physicist, NASA test pilot, and astronaut and was one of 12 pilots who flew the North American X-15, an experimental space plane jointly operated by the Air Force and NASA. The X-15 is cut loose seven miles over the Mojave Desert to fall free and glide back to Earth, testing the stability of the most radically different aerodynamic structure ever engineered. In 1963, Walker made three flights above 50 miles, therefore qualifying as an astronaut according to the United States definition of the boundary of space. The latter two, X-15 flights 90 and 91, also surpassed the Karman line, the internationally accepted boundary of 100 kilometers. Making the latter flights immediately after the completion of the Mercury and Vostok programs Walker became the first person to fly to space twice. He was the only X-15 pilot to fly above 100 kilometers during the program. He is credited with filming not less than five sightings during one of his missions. None of the films have ever been released to the public. Walker was killed on June 8, 1966 when his F-104N Starfighter Chase aircraft collided with a North American XB-70 Valkyrie. At an altitude of about 25,000 feet, Walker's Starfighter was one of five aircraft in a tight formation for a General Electric publicity photo when his F-104 drifted into contact with the XB-70's right wing tip. The plane flipped over, passed over the top of the XB-70, striking both its vertical stabilizers and its left wing in the process, and exploded, killing Walker. The Valkyrie entered an uncontrollable spin and crashed into the ground north of Barstow, California, killing co-pilot Carl Cross. Its pilot, Alvin White, one of Walker's colleagues from the Man in Space Soonest program ejected and was the sole survivor. The USAF summary report of the accident investigation stated that, given the position of the F-104 relative to the XB-70, the F-104 pilot would not have been able to see the XB-70's wing, except by uncomfortably looking back over his left shoulder. The report stated that it was likely that Walker, piloting the F-104, maintained his position by looking at the fuselage of the XB-70, forward of his position. The unlikeliness of a test pilot and astronaut with such a long career making a mistake like this was not considered by the accident investigators. In 1962, McDivitt was selected as an astronaut by NASA with Astronaut Group 2. He became manager of lunar landing operations and was the Apollo spacecraft program manager from 1969 to 1972. In June 1972, he left NASA.
White was selected as one of the second group of astronauts, the so-called Next Nine, who took part in the Gemini and Apollo missions. He was assigned as pilot of Gemini 4, alongside command pilot James McDivitt. On June 3, 1965, White became the first American to walk in space. He was assigned as senior pilot of the first crewed Apollo mission, Apollo 1. White died on January 27, 1967, alongside astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom and Roger B. Chaff in a fire during pre-launch testing for Apollo 1 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. He was awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal for his flight in Gemini 4 and was then awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor posthumously. In 1965, the two astronauts were doing a test run over Hawaii. They saw a metallic object with huge arms. Astronaut McDivitt took several photos of the object. These have never been released to the public. His partner, Ed White, was sleeping during the sighting. In December 1965, Gemini 7 astronauts James Lovell and Frank Borman saw a UFO during their second orbit of their record-breaking 14-day flight. Borman reported that he saw an unidentified spacecraft some distance from their capsule. Gemini Control at Cape Kennedy told him he was seeing the final stage of their own Titan booster rocket. Bogey at 10 o'clock high. This is Houston. Say again, 7. Said we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high. Roger. At this point, the live broadcast of the conversation is interrupted by Capcom. Gemini 7, is that the booster or is that an actual sighting? We have several... Actual sighting. Estimated distance or size? We also have the booster in sight. Borman confirmed that he could see the booster rocket all right, but that he could also see something completely different. He is reported to have taken some magnificent photos of two mushroom-shaped UFOs on December 4th. The pictures seem to show the glow of a propulsion system on the underside. The pictures were taken at a range of several hundred yards. In 2003, China's first astronaut, Yang Liwei, gets a haunting experience as he hears a knocking on the outside of his spaceship's door. There are no faults with his craft, so is he imagining it, or is there someone, or something, on the outside knocking to get in? Cosmonauts Leonid Kazim, Vladimir Solyov, and cardiologist Olaf Atkov were on their 155th day aboard the Salyut 7, conducting medical experiments, when the trio noticed what they described as a brilliant orange cloud surrounding the station. The Salyut 7 had been plagued by a steady stream of system failures, and the men aboard the craft were understandably concerned that the glow might represent a life-threatening fire. Fearing the worst, the cosmonauts rushed to the portholes 
only to find themselves blinded by an intense luminescence that poured in through the circular apertures. After their vision adjusted to the light, the cosmonauts radioed ground control, telling them that the station was bathed in an anomalous, self-illuminated mist. men returned to the portholes, shielding their eyes from the radiance, and that's when they spied something so incredible that it would alter their perception of reality. According to reports published in newspapers across the globe, the three Russian explorers saw colossal, winged, humanoid creatures hovering just outside the station in the vacuum of space. They were said to resemble those of humans with peaceful expressions, and the Soviet scientists claimed that the creatures noticed them and offered distinctly beatific smiles. This quote was published in the newspaper reports. Quote, what we saw were seven giant figures in the form of humans, but with wings and mist-like halos as in the classic depiction of angels. The cosmonauts described these haloed beings as nearly 80 feet in height, with a wingspan comparable to that of a 747. The men observed the seraphim for 10 minutes before they vanished leaving the isolated comrades to ponder what it was that they had seen, trying to gather the courage to report it to their superiors. By their own admission, the cosmonauts were themselves reluctant to accept the existence of the angelic beings which they had seen, and concluded that they were more likely suffering from some form of mass delusion brought on by their long space journey, rather than an actual encounter with alien entities. Their self-induced denial was put to the test 11 days later when additional cosmonauts arrived at the station and the celestial beings returned. Which brings us to the next mystery. According to reports, just days after the new Soviet cosmonauts were aboard the Salyut 7, the orange glow again enveloped the station. This time, all six of the space travelers were said to have witnessed the gigantic winged beings keeping pace with the station, which they once again dutifully reported to the alarmed ground control team below. As the six cosmonauts stared out of the portholes, they must have been overwhelmed by sensations of awe, wonder, and fear. They were all skilled pilots, scientists and doctors, who after years of knowing where they stood on the evolutionary scale, were confronted with humanoid creatures soaring in the dark vacuum of space. Creatures that seemed not merely alien, but supernatural. According to news accounts, one of the cosmonauts stated, quote, They were glowing, and we were truly overwhelmed. There was a great orange light, and through it, we could see the figures of seven angels. 
They were smiling, as though they shared a glorious secret. But within a few minutes, they were gone, and we never saw them again. After the space angels disappeared, Gizim, Selyov, and Atkov could no longer dismiss the phenomenon as a communal hallucination brought on by the pressure of a long mission in orbit. They now shared the encounter with three new witnesses, all of whom were just as perplexed as the first set of cosmonauts days earlier. This left both the explorers and the crew at Mission Control to ponder the question, what did the cosmonauts witness? Zanetbekov, Savitskaya, and Volk returned to Earth via the Soyuz T-12, but Kazim, Solyov, and Atkov remained in orbit around the Salyut 7 for a record-setting 237 days. On their return, they were subjected to a battery of physical and psychological examinations to see if there might be a medical explanation for the phenomenon. But, according to all accounts, they passed both with flying colors. The medical diagnosis leaves only one of two viable conclusions. The first is that six cosmonauts, in two separate instances, would jeopardize their careers, reputations, and even their lives, all for the sake of a prank. The second conclusion is that they saw, quote, angels, end quote, or at the very least, anomalous astronautic entities that bear a very distinct resemblance to what many of the followers of the Abrahamic traditions would consider divine messengers. On May 5, 1981, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Kovalyanok saw something remarkable from the porthole of Salyut 6. According to Kovalyanok, as the spacecraft was flying over South Africa, moving towards the Indian Ocean, he saw an elliptical-shaped object that was flying along with the spacecraft. It looked like it would rotate in flight direction. Quote, the object resembles a barbell. I saw it becoming transparent and like with a body inside. At the other end, I saw something like gas discharging, like a reactive object. Then something happened that is very difficult for me to describe from the point of view of physics, Kavalyanok said. He added, I have to recognize that it did not have an artificial origin. It was not artificial because an artificial object couldn't attain this form. I don't know of anything that can make this movement, tightening, then expanding, pulsating. Then as I was observing, something happened. Two explosions. One explosion, then 0.5 seconds later, the second part exploded. I called my colleague Victor, but he didn't arrive in time to see anything. The object moved in a suborbital path, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to see it. 
there were two clouds like smoke that formed a barbell. It came near me and I watched it. End quote. They entered into the darkness for some time after the incident and didn't see the two spheres again. Astronaut Slayton claimed decades after the incident that he had witnessed a UFO while test flying a P-51 fighter jet over Hastings near Minneapolis on the 19th of December, 1951. In his 1995 book, Deke, U.S. Man Space, From Mercury to the Shuttle, he would speak about the incident in detail. The day was a bright winter day, the afternoon sun shining crisply and precisely. Slayton was at an altitude of around 10,000 feet when he saw what he thought was a kite in the distance in front of him. Realizing that he was too high for the object to be a kite, he moved in for a closer look. He said, quote, As soon as I go behind the darn thing, it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a saucer, a disc. The object was moving away from him and quickly, despite the fact he was traveling at just over 300 miles per hour. He watched it for several minutes before it climbed upwards and, quote, just flatly disappeared. Slayton, much like Cooper, was considered one of the finest pilots of his day with a particularly above average aptitude for flying. In fact, he was so highly recommended that he was handpicked as one of the first astronauts to enter the U.S. space program. Astronaut Leroy Chow, at the time commander of the International Space Station, reported a UFO encounter during a spacewalk in 2005. Along with an astronaut colleague, he was installing navigation antennas. Then, something unusual caught Chow's attention. Down in the Earth's atmosphere, he saw a line of light that looked like an upside-down question mark. Skeptics have proposed that he saw the lights of fishing boats. None of the skeptics have ventured into explaining what sort of lights those ships must have featured to be seen from space, hundreds of miles above. The Apollo missions were considered NASA's most successful space program. The transcripts from three of these missions make for interesting reading. There's a strange light down there. Is it a bonfire? It might be campfires. How does it look? Here is the Apollo 10 transcript which has become known as Whistling in Space. It needs no explanation. That music even sounds outer spacey, doesn't it? You hear that? That whistling sound? Yeah. Did you hear that whistling sound too? Yes. Sounds like, you know, outer space type music. I wonder what it is. Boy, that sure is weird music. We're gonna have to find out about that. Nobody will believe us. Yes? It's a whistling, you know, 
Like an outer space type thing. I mean, you... What the hell was that gurgling noise? I don't know. But I'll tell you, that eerie music is what's bothering me. You know that... Goddamn, I heard it too. You know that was funny. That's just like something from outer space, really. Who's going to believe it? Nobody. Shall we tell them about it? I don't know. We ought to think about it some. Did you hear it, Tom? Yeah, I heard it. Hell, I just want to get out of this suit. Number 17. Apollo 11 transcripts. Roads on the moon. That is a spectacular crater. Did you shoot some pictures while you were over there? No, it's just going by. We better get it later. There will be better times if the damn antenna isn't in the way. Boy, there must be nothing more desolate than to be inside some of those craters, those conical ones. The people that live in there probably never got out. Oh God, look at that monkey. He's my favorite. <laughs> look at that son of a bitch. You see all those roads? Triangular roads leading right past him? And here is the Apollo 14 transcript. Are there dikes on the moon? Really an interesting one. Huh. That one... looks like... got a rugged one right out there. With the central peaks. Sure does. Got a really complex central structure. It's got one of the biggest central peaks around. It's a very unusual crater. But there are some dark areas in it that Farouk has gone on record as saying there are dikes. Hi, son. That one right down there just shows how it dominates the whole photograph. Just an extremely bright crater. Sun angle just isn't high enough for you to see it here. Yes, they're mining it, I think. SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavor spacecraft had a close call with an unidentified object before reaching the International Space Station, a report said. U.S. Space Command warned the crew aboard the spacecraft of a possible collision with an unknown object after launching into orbit on Friday. Quote, the possibility of the conjunction came so close to the closest approach time that there wasn't time to compute and execute a debris avoidance maneuver with confidence. So the SpaceX team elected to have the crew don their pressure suits out of an abundance of caution. End quote. NASA spokesperson Kelly Humphreys told Futurism, at its closest point, the object passed about 28 miles away from the spacecraft, the report said. Ultimately, quote, there was no real danger to the crew or the spacecraft, Humphreys told the outlet. Crew Dragon Endeavor made it to the International Space Station on Saturday. The U.S. Space Agency released a series of pictures taken during the March 1969 launch. One shows astronaut Dave Scott wearing a red helmet as he climbs out of the command module in orbit high above the Earth. Other pictures look down on the surface at lands and oceans covered by wispy clouds. Now. A YouTuber claims one of these images is evidence of extraterrestrials and posted video with a close-up to demonstrate. The YouTuber, who goes by the name Secure Team 10, believes the crew had no idea they had snapped the UFO. He says, quote, This is a photo that was snapped by one of the astronauts doing spacewalks before coming safely back down to Earth. 
and just like in the past photos, a dark triangular craft seen above Earth in shuttle missions that happened many decades later. This was discovered to be lurking among these clouds, all the way back in the mid-60s when this photo was taken. This thing is virtually undetectable. Even when the photo is halfway zoomed in, it's still hard to see. When we go all the way in, we get yet another dark triangle UFO that seems to be at an angle as if it's flying right above the clouds, right at the line where the Earth's atmosphere meets space. Almost like it was just orbiting the Earth along with the astronauts who likely when snapping this photo had no idea that this mysterious black triangle was hundreds of miles away in the distance." End quote. Yes, the truth is out there. And here you have met a few stories from some of the most highly trained and tested people in existence. Professionals who regularly go through every conceivable test to ascertain their mental and physical facilities are fully operational. Humans who have been taken to the limit of endurance, who lived their life on the edge. The astronauts and cosmonauts aren't average Joes. They are the best of the best. Let's finish this documentary with the words of a spiritual world leader, the Dalai Lama. The number of habitable worlds in our galaxy alone exists in the tens of billions, and that's on the lower end of the scale. And the number of habitable galaxies we can see apart from our own is approximately 100 billion. That means there are billions of planets within each galaxy, in a sea of galaxies, which seems to be infinite, that we are aware of. To ponder the idea that intelligent extraterrestrial life might exist out there in all that endless possibility, only seems natural. How could there not be? If we looked down at the world from space, we would not see any demarcations of natural boundaries. We would simply see one small planet. Just one. My name is Stanton Friedman. I was a nuclear physicist for a number of years. I brought some strange qualifications to ufology. I worked on advanced propulsion systems so I could deal with the you can't get here from there kind of guys. I uh, have had to think about all the why questions because I always get asked them and people seem to find my answers edifying, if you will. And it's much easier to handle the nasty, noisy negativists, as I call them, when you know their side as well as yours, and you know they haven't done their homework. I have yet to find a debunker who has done his homework. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to defend his position, because there's plenty of data showing he's full of baloney. After 51 years of study and investigation, I've reached four major conclusions about flying saucers. And I prefer the term flying saucers. Oh, why don't you say UFO? Because all flying saucers are UFOs. Very few UFOs are flying saucers. I'm interested in the flying saucers, not in the UFOs. First, the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. Secondly, the subject of flying saucers represents a kind of cosmic water gate meaning some few people within major governments have known since at least 1947 that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft. I'm not saying everybody in the government knows. I worked under security. You don't keep secrets by telling everybody. You restrict the access as much as you possibly can. Need to know, compartmentalization, all this sort of thing. Third conclusion is that none of the arguments made against the first two, 
by a small group of very noisy negativists, including my University of Chicago classmate, Carl Sagan, stand up under careful scrutiny. Oh, they sound splendid. But when you look at the data, uh, Carl, for example, just to give an, uh, an example of that, said there are interesting sightings that aren't reliable. There are reliable sightings that aren't interesting. Those are true statements. But there are no interesting and reliable sightings. That's totally false. Biggest study done for the United States Air Force. The better the quality of the sighting, the higher the reliability. The more likely to be unexplainable. That's a fact. And finally, the fourth conclusion. We're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft. 